wanted to, always wanted to come here, but the hockey team sucks, so I got a, <laughs> um, a spot on the team over at Harvard and stayed, stayed there for a couple years and went and uh, played professional hockey. And uh, the day that I got my signing bonus, I, I showed up uh, at the flight school and, and started getting my license. And I, I knew that I was on to something. I had flown a little bit um, as a kid. And when I was in high school, I designed a, uh, well, kind of modified a, the back of the popular science uh, magazine um, plans of a ultralight into something. But I, I kept cutting corners. And my mother ended up actually burning the airplane so I wouldn't kill myself. And uh, so when I had enough dough to, to go in and start flying, but it was kind of expensive, I started that immediately and kind of refocused all my efforts towards uh, designing new types of pilot interfaces for airplanes and experimenting with translating the natural motion of the, uh, of the pilot the same way they ride a motorcycle or walk through the world into um, the, the motion of the airplane. And that's what led me to this opportunity. So I, I, I went all up and down the East Coast pitching every investor that I could, I could find this idea of translating the, uh, the motion that the, that, the, that the humans naturally make as they move through the world to keep coordinated turns as they walk or they ride a bike into flying an aircraft. And prove this by putting pressure sensors inside the legs of a motorcycle rider on the feet, some, some tags on the shoulders, and some, uh, some strain gauges on the bar, and built full motion simulators with pilots flying from the motorcycle position, which forced them to have a coordinated turn all the time. I pitched that to everybody that would listen, but nobody would listen. Uh, but there was one investor who said, I'll, I'll fund something else that you, you have. And, and I had a series resonant converter, really boring stuff, doing die casting, started a business uh, doing power supplies for die casting. And then sold that business and started a business doing um, very large power supplies that would buffer the irregularities of wind farms and, uh, and consumer inject uh, real and reactive power to stabilize uh, the grids down in, down in Hawaii. I spent a lot of time in Hawaii. And everywhere I went, I found every excuse I could to fly everywhere that I was going. And then started a business called Design Book that, uh, that, that formed teams of people with common passions and complementary skill sets. And my thought was I could form a team to, to implement this idea around the, uh, the, the, the natural uh, control of an airplane. We got, uh, we got a cease and desist by Facebook, which was awesome. We were in the Wall Street Journal, got hundreds of thousands of users on the app, but we um, we couldn't do anything with it because we were we were pursued by Facebook because we had book in our name, and I ended up doing a uh, favor for a buddy who knew knew I liked aircraft and had spent a lot of time in um, in uh, batteries and and energy conversion. And he said, "Why don't you come on down and do a review of a electric aircraft that uh, is being designed out in California?" And I'm telling you this story because it's not always easy to get into to the fun side of uh, aerospace engineering. And I showed up. I didn't, wasn't getting paid to be there. And I had dissected a, um, a paper written by a company doing, um, doing an electric helicopter. And I presented it. And in the audience was a gal by the name of Martine Rothblatt, who was the founder of Sirius XM Radio and United Therapeutics, both multi-billion dollar companies. She's a helicopter pilot and a fixed wing pilot. And halfway through the discussion, there's 20 people in the room, she said, whoa, whoa, who are you and why are you here? And uh, this why are you here will come up as a theme. And I said, well, I, I'm Kyle. I, I have a little bit of experience in batteries. And, and I'm here because Scott asked me to do it. And she goes, are you getting paid to be here? I said, no. I, I just thought it'd be fun to talk airplanes and think about flying and think about how we could electrify things because that's where there's this kind of convergence of some expertise and a passion. And uh, she hit me with five or six other questions and said, let's have coffee. And this right here is the result of uh, a, a cup of coffee on a Friday morning just about two years ago where I spent um, a good amount of time talking to Martine about how to drive innovation. And in something that I was passionate about, which was flying, how to drive innovation in that. And, and I said, all right, great, let's, uh, let's go. And we went into it. 
And she said, how would you do this? And I got home and I thought about some of the comments she made. I thought about her, her approach to things, the practitioner in her. And I said, we just built something. Let's, let's start by building something and let's explore. And let's get the right fidelity of the tool, the right depth of the fidelity of the tool to explore each technical step in the development of an aircraft. And let's set an audacious goal and let's fly across the country with it. So I got home at about midnight and I just painted a watercolor and I wrote all over the watercolor. And this was the very top of the watercolor. And I put a budget in, I put a timeline in, and at nine o'clock in the morning she said, you're on. And she sent us a couple million bucks and said, go for it. So this is the story of how we did that. And this is a story of just, just trial and error and micro experimentation at every level to get to where we needed to get and about keeping our promise. So we, we had a saying internally, um, well, for, first of all, just simple enough to be revolutionary, but every time there was a question, should we go this direction, should we go this direction? Should we do it with a traditional rotorcraft? Should we do it with a fixed wing aircraft? And we just kept reminding ourselves, what was the promise that we made? It was to elicit critical thinking in electric aviation. So after exploring 35, 38 different designs, we started to compare things like complexity and criticality and simplicity and range to get to, to exploit the benefits of electric propulsion and get a practical aircraft. What did we need to do? Well, we need to get it on a wing. We need to have low disk loading. We need to get high uh, specific energy density batteries and low empty weight fractions. And these were the simple levers we knew we needed to pull. And this is the sketch that, that I that, that we, we used to catalyze the first directional push of the team. And then naturally, you need to put together a team. This is our team now. We started with four people. We started with four people to get to our critical design review. And the first step was putting everything into a simulator. Well, when I was at, at Harvard across the street, down the street here, I met a guy by the name of Austin Meyer. Does anybody know Austin Meyer? He, he founded X-Plane. And when I was there and I was telling him about my challenges about taking the angular and linear accelerations out of X-plane and translate that through a motion queuing algorithm to show that this motorcycle-like aircraft would work, I needed him to change the output of X-plane so I could do it more efficiently and do it without any latency. He did that, so I called him up and I said, hey, we got a new problem, we got a new problem. We have to model 35, 50 different aircraft. And we know that the hardest thing that we're gonna do here is not integrating things, but probably writing the flight controller for it and doing a transition from a rotor to a wing. So let's write a flight controller for each of these, an autopilot to, 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 to do this. Let's just count the lines of code, and let's just say, how simple is this autopilot going to be to do? So we, we, we started doing that, and we started looking at the different transition dynamics. You can see some oscillations on the glide path and final here. These are tracers showing the, the, the final approach. And everybody can, can visualize and, 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 and see the way a transitioning aircraft can transition out. But has anybody here flown a transitioning aircraft, got into an Osprey simulator or something? The, the odd thing is transitioning back. It's a thing, everybody just visualizes the obvious step in every problem. But transitioning back when your wings asymmetrically stall, or your rotor's getting to high speed edgewise flight, while you're trying to slow down and you've got, you've got three variables in two equations where you're saying, I'm gonna use my distribution of propulsion to affect the stability of the aircraft, and you say, oops, and I'm trying to descend, so I can only push air down to make airplane go up, and now I'm trying to go down all around. So I, do I push less over here, I can't reverse this, and this vector is changing, for example, and you're saying, well, my vector's pointed halfway up, halfway down. So if I elicit a control, versus control input over here, to pick this side up, I'm also inducing a yaw. So as you kind of dissect these different problems on the reverse transition, which is the hard problem, we start to look at the stability of this and we start to add, use some metrics to define how efficient of a transition we can get. The pitch, de the deck angle, right? What, how much, how far off the glide slope the thing's gonna get. And uh, we started threading these things together. This is Austin, fun guy. Um, and and explain, does, it, does explain, just, just to give it, give it a little bit of, um, get back to the tools. Everybody knows what CFD is here. You guys probably are, are way more educated than I am on this. But we looked at this problem and we said, well, let's use, let's use something called blade element theory. And it's in X-Plane already. And let's augment that a little bit with the things necessary to capture things like coaxial rotors. And this is a flow field, very, very simplistic flow field around an aircraft. 
in blade element theory, and I won't go through the, the, the basics of it, but basically 60 times a second this thing's determining its next state. So we flew this thing, we flew it, we built simple simulators, we grew up a little bit more, we started uh, analyzing the pilot experience. Um, these are, these, I think this is, no, this is a different slide. You, the, you know, we got, we got to the point where things were getting super frustrating. Um, we started to write autopilots. Does anybody know what Xavion is? Xavion's an app, it's actually on the, on the App Store. Just yesterday we released 3D instrument approaches, synthetic vision, 3D instrument approaches to play with it and give us feedback, please. But we use that as a kernel for an autopilot. And, uh, and we flew more, we put it into VR, and then we started to convince ourselves that this could be an actual product. It wasn't just a fun thing. And we built a network of aircraft and recharging pads all around New York City in a virtual world. And we started flying these things in all different weather and analyzing how these things would handle. So we said, we're going to build this aircraft. Maybe we should have a path to doing something with this aircraft. Started building small scale models. Everybody probably has flown this little trainer. It's, it's like the ubiquitous foam $100 trainer. But you see that there's four tilting rotors on the, on the corners. And it takes off, it tilts forward, and we started to explore simple flight control algorithms. We made a bigger and bigger trainer. And then we started to, to look at how we were going to get the, the, big, the big challenge of moving from a quad or a drone flight controller, which Utilize, usually has a, a single point of failure. It's got a single flight controller, it's got a single inertial measurement unit, a single GPS, and one of those fails, things fall out of the sky. And we're gonna put a person in this, then we're gonna to have to look at redundancy and how we manage that redundancy. And we started to divide up the aircraft and doing something called a fault hazard analysis, an FHA. And we started doing that here. And this is when we started to split these motors, a top motor and a bottom motor. And then you look at the power supply to these things, and you look at two different batteries, and you say, if I have two batteries, how am I going to spread that across the aircraft? So if I lose one battery, the thing can still stay rubber side down. What failure modes are palatable, which are not palatable? How many people fly a helicopter here? Anybody? Like, main rotor or tail rotor, which would you rather lose? <laughs> Main rotor, well, you're a sadistic, but that's, the, you don't want to lose the main rotor, but you want to lose the tail rotor, right? Tail rotor, you lose the tail rotor, things are a little bit ugly, you're going to come in 25 degrees at 40 knots or whatever, and you're going to be able to survive that, right? So an uncommanded yaw is something that could be survivable in a, in a drum, right? But a uh, uncommanded pitch or roll puts you upside down and you're done. So when we write a control algorithm, we say, what's my prioritization? First. Well, how do I spread that power? Well, obvious statement, let's put one here, one here, one here, and one here on the top, run that with one battery, one flight controller. And then take the bottom ones and use a different flight controller, right? Same control arm, they have to know that each other exists. Simple, we started looking at air speeds, of course, and we got all that together, this is our flight controller, started flying this thing, and I put this picture on here just so you understand how quickly this is iterating. This is like three, four weeks in. And we're like, let's get this thing flying. We got it in the simulator, let's get it cranked out. Team comes together, it's four of us again. I say, let's build an iron bird. Let's, let's construct this thing in the lab. So we start building the iron bird. We start running motors back to back. Everybody knows the MRAX motor they use on, on, on electric sailplanes. Reinhardt inverters are the ones that win the peg's peak every year. Obvious things, let's throw these together and start working. Uh, I grew up in a machine shop. My dad, my dad had machine shops. So we went over there and we started cutting parts. And we knew we needed to reduce. In order to get low disk loading, we needed to get big rotors. Motors, electric motors, to produce power, which is torque times speed, of course, you need to get things moving pretty quick, right? To get power density. But now we need torque density. So what's the, what's the easiest diameters? in axial flow rotors, in a tilting rotor, gets pretty ugly, right? It's like a radial engine. So we, we started to design uh, epicyclic gearboxes, and you can see some pieces here. McLaren said they could produce these for us, <coughs> harden them, find the materials, and they dropped the ball. So we quickly pivoted and said, we're not going to drop the project, we've got to keep our promise. We started building uh, carbon belt drive systems. We uh, wired up the iron bird, and this is the beginnings of an iron bird. And you can see these cartridges here with two inverters, one radiator, which is, which is hydraulically separated, and two inverters on each end. 
Um, this is, I put this up here, this guy Steve Arms on the left side. He started a business in sensors. He made, made IMUs that Airbus uses, a whole bunch of folks. He heard what we were doing and he said, holy shit, you guys are having fun doing this. You're loving what you're doing. You're a bunch of artists out here doing this. I want to join the team. We had more than half our team not getting paid. Diving into this program is, it, it, with so much passion and that smile captures it all. Same thing with Dave Churchill on the ground here. Um, we got to the point where we said, what are the two things we cannot tolerate? Rotor failure, or separation, and a battery fire. Battery fire, who's been around a lithium ion battery fire? Anybody? Probably five of you. Um, this pack right here in testing, um, we had a cascading failure, five cells, do, 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 and of course that just lit off the rest. I unloaded seven canisters of, uh, of, of fire extinguishers into that battery and it doesn't put it out. There is, there is a, a lithium ion battery failure, fire is untenable. Put those into packs and this was our iron bird. You've got a cockpit, you've got control systems, you've got pedals, you've got complete avionics, redundant motors. Those two inverters, like I said, are completely separate electrically. Different controllers, different batteries, different liquid cooling systems into the motors and because we've got short change on the gearboxes, put belt drives on. We said, all right, well, let's, we got to shove this into an aircraft. So we started to just hack together a CAD model. We took a Lancer ES. Who knows what a Lancer is? Yeah, they're all over Reno Aero Races, right? High speed records are very slippery little planes. And the, the efficiency of going from sketch to model, no drawings. Simple, simple concepts on cooling. Very, very basic first principles things. When we got to the components that we said we couldn't fail, these outriggers that reach out the front of the plane, start vertical and tilt forward as you fly forward and then come back to vertical to land, we knew those were going to be really hot items. Hot items and like they, they, they need to be designed. 64 pounds, that's a carbon outrigger looking at a 4,000 pound plane. Put strain gauges on them, flex the thing, move the thing. We built vibration test stands and then we took our airplane and we chopped the tail off it. Does anybody know why we chopped the tail off it? Anybody know why they have drooping flaps on a V-22 Osprey? Everybody knows why, right? Because of the downwash of the rotors. They have these massive drooping flaps on the outside. And ailerons or flaps, whatever you want to call them, flap runs. We couldn't have a traditional tail because those rear rotors would blow down on the tail, change the incidence, then it becomes totally unstable in pitch during transition. So we chopped the tail off and designed a new tail. The new tail is a T-tail. Um, everything about the donor aircraft was out of square. I was hoping there was a wing picture in here because we put in, oh, there, there may be one coming up. Um, built battery boxes, again, weight is king in airplanes, it's just compounding. Put this carbon trash can across the back to hold the races of the bearings. Um, this wing right here, uh, holding up a 4,000 pound airplane, um, was initially rated for a 220 knot airplane. We slowed this thing down to about 120 knots. We were able to go from 350 pound, take the fuel system out, put a lower slide of skin on it, take the de-icing off the front. So we just put inserts in existing molds and pulled the carbon wing off of here at 250 pounds. That entire wing is 250 pounds, which is awesome. Put the outriggers, you guys are starting to see the visual, visualize how the aircraft's coming together. Outriggers on it. This was, could have been the smartest thing we ever did. And if, if there was one thing to take away in aircraft design is don't do what Learjet does. And when they, if they put a battery in the back of a Learjet, they'll put the battery on a dumb waiter and they'll suck the thing back up into the tail. Now you've got a dumb waiter, you've got a pulley, you've got a cable, you've got all these retainment systems, and you've got this battery tucked away from the tail. We said we, we need to make service this thing. So this gun cartridge right here is on, on 3D printed rails and you just slide it in there. Literally, you can complete a flight and rip it out and put a thermal camera on it and, and look at the entire profile of that system right there. But when you're servicing it, it's in and out, in and out. And uh, in the middle there, you see the air inlet and the air exhaust and little 3D printed ducts that force that air through the, uh, through the, um, through the system. EMI issues, these are just sketches that were on there. You saw the belt drives, put the props on the aircraft. Yeah, I, here, in electric aircraft, it, it, who remembers the movie Armageddon, the worst environment imaginable. That's what this is like for controls. You've got permanent magnet motors, not a lot of iron, right? Basically no iron. And you've got these really, really high frequency systems because you want to keep 
you drive really low inductance motors, 30, 40 kilohertz inverters, and then you're trying to get really high integrity data out to your inverters, really high integrity IMU information back, really high integrity what fly by wire systems, because in Hubbard you're always in fly by wire, right? And the shielding, it, you can't solve it the way that you, if you, if you work for Raytheon and you're building a ground based missile system and they're like, hey, in my MC, we can get it down to here, and you're like, that's easy. We'll put shielding, we'll put ferrets, we'll cover this whole bugger up, and we're done. You want to fly with that? All of a sudden, you take all the weight out again, right? So, how do you start shielding things? And you have to use innovative tricks. And you have to understand the electromagnetic noise in order to attenuate it. And all of a sudden, you're decoupling things with capacitors, putting silver paint on things. And you're getting to something that, that adds grams instead of pounds on, for every one of these solutions. So, I know I changed the method. Not the dimensions, the, uh, the unit. Um, we, we had a lot of issues with bolts and vibration and shearing off. We took these things in and out and in and out through ground power tests. We had hundreds and hundreds of ground power tests. We were, we were, we were totally committed to shake this thing to death before we put it in the air. Um, galling was a big issue. Aluminum pieces, you know, they get next to each other. Any motion just galls the snot out of them. And all of a sudden, they get really sticky. And they basically friction weld themselves together. Batteries, again, we wanted to make sure that these things were thermally stable. So we would run the thing. We specifically designed the cowling so we could take the cowling off real quick and take thermal images of it. Make sure that our, 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 our surface temperatures were what we expected so we could predict the internal temperatures. You, know, you can't put thermocouples on every cell. And you have 15,000 cells in here. You're going to poke them down in a couple spaces. You do an FDA on it. You calibrate that FDA against what you're getting. You look at the surface temperatures, and you start to understand it. Traditional airplanes, right? We've got, we've got cowl flaps. We've got mixtures. We've got prop settings. We've got all these things that, that we're super familiar with. What are the critical things in an electric airplane? You've got to keep the controls power alive, right? You have to keep the compute. How many people shut the master off on their buddy while you're flying, right? You're like, oh. Oh, shit's still running. <laughs> right? You can't do that in an in a electric aircraft. You've got to have controls power. So you have to rethink the way things are designed. So this is just a, just a sampling of the different things that go into there. And then when you're test flying the thing, let me give you an example of that. If you have a Tesla car, anybody know that there's a fuse in the back of the Model 3? Pull the floorboard, you can see the fuse ring. Um, you think you'd ever, you'd ever tolerate something like that in, in an electric aircraft? How do you want things to fail when you're in the air coming on final approach into Mass General? Probably want to keep the power on, right? <laughs> if something fails. Do you want a contactor that latches closed or latches open? Probably latches closed. All the things are the opposite of what you want in automotive or in industrial design. So you have to rethink all this logic. And then when you're test flying the thing, when, when we test fly like a, a turbine aircraft, you're looking at pressures and speeds and temperatures the turbine, you're looking at fuel flows, and here, you're not looking at any of that. The, the second most important thing, I would argue, would be your CAN bus load and your CAN bus drop rate. Things start to get, get messy on that CAN bus, and you've lost control of the aircraft, and you're done, right? You, you're happy to run out of batteries, in this, but you're not happy to have something go full torque one direction or another, right? So we're looking at completely different things while we're flying, and I, and I apologize for the picture here. But you're, that whole center display is looking at fly-by-wire systems. Another big thing that you, you learn when you're flying this type of aircraft is as you, as you go through transition, the inertial measurement unit, remember the inertial measurement unit and the fly-by-wire sensor is coming off the pilot. Let me talk about that for one second. Um, 